perfect. Uh, we tend to do these as a bit of a conversation, a presentation, um, and then room for questions and discussion at the end. So uh, without further ado, most of you guys probably know who Marc Boulanger is, but uh, I'd like to introduce him. We did one of our summer tours uh, at his farm up near St. Rose this summer, which was a roller crimped crop um, with winter wheat seeded in. That was honestly one of the most beautiful winter wheat fields I saw all summer last year. Um, and there's been lots of questions even for myself on what the logistics of planning this is, but also the financial management of, of planning a two-year cycle like this. So we wanted to invite him to present on uh, what the summary was now that the, the summer's over, he's harvested this crop, how did it go? So without further ado, Mark, I'll let you take it away. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, I'll try and tell the story like I did at the summer tour. Um, always a lot easier in person, but we'll see what we can do over Zoom. Um, if it works later, I'll try and show a few videos when I'm done. But uh, I kind of threw a few slides together of some still pictures uh, just to see if it would work this way and try and explain what I've done and how I got there. And then hopefully there's people on the call that'll help me with uh, what to do next. Because um, the first three years, I kind of had a somewhat of a plan that worked out very, very well. And now I'm trying to figure out what to do with the next three years. So, so everybody can see that on the screen, my, my first slide. That's a yes? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, if uh, Marika, if you can kind of monitor the chat. So if there's any questions, let me know. Um, like you said, uh, with the intro, it's very um, informal. So that's good because I'm not an expert or a polished presenter. Okay, so uh, how it happened. Uh, my first line here is always read the organic voice. So it would have been approximately three years ago right now. Um, I was, it was brutal cold in the winter of 2021 and uh, the Organic Producers Association of Manitoba sent out their quarterly newsletter called The Organic Voice. And I was slipping through The Organic Voice, reading some of the certification stuff that uh, I should probably know more about. And then I was cruising through to the, uh, the classifieds always Interesting to see who's got what for sale, kind of like an organic e-Brandon. And uh, and in there, there was a, an ad for land for rent. And so I took a look at this advertisement and I kind of looked at the legal land description. And I went, well, where the heck is that? So I uh, figured out that it was north of St. Rose, Manitoba. And because I had time on my hands, apparently, I kind of started doing some investigating. And uh, I had a buddy up there, Rob Brunel, that I went to university with. And so I called him uh, just to find out about the land and kind of gave him the legal. And he said, well, I've got land a mile away from there. That's pretty decent land. What's the story? And so what happened was, is that the owner of the land was looking for someone to farm it organically. And so he had a renter that he was happy with, but uh, wanted it farmed organically. Turns out that the guy that was renting it was another guy I went to university with. So I uh, called him and asked a few other questions. And he said, combination of the guy wanting to rent it to somebody else, or sorry, not wanting it to rent to somebody else, but to have it farmed organically. And, um, and that uh, he actually was in a spot where he was looking to farm a few less acres as well. He had a lot on his plate. And so, so this opportunity came up. I contacted the owner and um, we struck a deal on a five-year rental. And so, so I've got this land for 21, 22, 23, 24, and 2025. And so like I've got on the slide here, the previous rotation was a conventional farm. Uh, wheat, canola, soybeans, kind of in that rotation. And so the spring of 2021 was my first year with this land. And on the slide here, it grew, I said I grew TR1 oats with clover. 
And so the reason for growing the TR1 oats with clover or growing oats with clover is that um, it's not on every piece of land, but generally speaking, I wasn't sure what the history or what the land was going to be like as far as weeds. Uh, I thought if I grew oats, I had some options. Uh, we grow a lot of oats on our own farm here at Grand Clarier, Manitoba. And being a mixed farm, um, you know, it, it gives you the ability to either graze it, uh, to take it as green feed or to, or to combine it. And so that was the reason for growing the oats. Uh, the clover, part of the reason we grew the clover there was we actually had harvested some clover the year before. And so we had some of our own clover seed. And uh, the other thing about the clover was I was hoping that uh, again, the following year, being TR2, I would have some options. And so it shows on the slide here, 2022 sweet clover, you could bale it, uh, silage it, combine it. Um, after combining clover the year before, my brother Daniel told me that we weren't allowed to combine clover ever again. So that wasn't maybe the, the best option, but it, it at least gave you some options. Um, as it turns out, we did a roller crimp it and I'll show some slides and, and how that went. And then uh, 2023, we grew winter wheat, and I'll show some pictures of that. And then in 2024, going into this year, I'm, I'm really struggling with uh, what to do next. Um, so I'll, I'll be hoping that the crowd, when we get into this discussion later on, will maybe be able to share some opinions and ideas of what I can do next. Does that sound like a good intro, Marika? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. No comments from me. All right. Okay. So this is a picture of what I oh. saw on May 8th, 2021. Meters, like, yeah. For a week or so, I guess. So Umar, obviously, with... can you mute? Sorry, Mark. Umar, can you mute all attendees? Uh, Paul. You have to unmute yourself now, Mark. Sorry. It's yeah. all or none. All there right. So, so you can hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, so because I made this deal in the middle of February, uh, I had actually no idea what the land looked like. Um, you know, I had to take the word of the owner and uh, Rob Brunel and the guy that had previously owning or been renting it. Uh, so it turns out it's this big, wide, flat, half section of land, relatively flat half section of land. Uh, you'll see in the bottom of the corner, there's a few pebbles as well. Um, being from Grand Clarier, Manitoba, where we farm sand and, and our better land is heavy sand, uh, this, was, this was new land to me. The crop insurance rating is D uh, on the crop insurance rating. So it's uh, decent land. It is a little lighter on the I'd say on the um, east side of the of the half section, but overall it's it's a, a loamy sandy soil or loamy soil. Uh, so that it had been soybeans in 2020, and so they had harvested the soybeans and then ran across it with a, a chisel plow or a cultivator once in the fall. So that was all that had been done, and this is what it looked like on May 8th. page down, I think I need to hit. Okay, so uh, fast forward. Uh, basically what happened, uh, going back to that previous slide, so what happened was that it had been a fairly dry spring uh, in 2021. Uh, Rob Brunel was able to come in and sow this, I believe, on the 26th of May. And uh, so he just sowed right into it. There was no tillage at all that happened. He sowed right into that field as you see it. And then a floater from the co-op came along with the clover seed, blew on all the clover seed uh, to approximately four to five pounds an acre. And then, and then they rolled the field. So, so that's what happened in the spring of 2021. By August of 2021, this is what, uh, what I was doing. I think this is August 12th. Uh, 2021 in the St. Rose area and much of the Western, Western Canada was very, very dry. 
And so uh, the oats came in early. I was thinking that it would be a lot later in the year. Uh, when I went up and saw it in July, uh, early July, I was on my way to the lake and uh, couldn't believe how clean it was, for one. Um, there was basically no weeds, which was a shock to me, um, but uh, a pleasant surprise. And at the time in early July, you know, it looked like it was going to be okay and it was worth combining. Uh, the rest of July and early August was very dry, so it ended up being fairly short, um, but there was there was some oats there. So what ended up happening is uh, because I didn't have a plan, <laughs> and I, as in the first slide I showed, I was 273 kilometers away from home. I uh, was able to make a few phone calls and found somebody that would help me swath, combine, and haul the grain and actually had some storage as well. So the whole... Uh, the presentation here is about how I had the horseshoe in the right place the last three years and was able to make some moves and uh, with a little persistence make it all work. So the oats, we, we combined it in middle of August. Um, the bushel weight was okay, but it wasn't super heavy. Uh, for those of you that remember the prices in August or September of 2021, I think oats was right around $5. Uh, this was TR1 oats, so I had to sell it as conventional oats. And um, as it turns out, uh, the guy that I was renting the bins from didn't need the bins right away, so I just left it there. And luck would have it that the price of oats went up, and I was able to hold on till about, I think it was January or February of 2022, before I sold the oats. And... Um, Ended up selling it for, I think, right around $10. So I was pretty lucky there. And uh, I think the average yield was right around 45 bushels an acre. So so it wasn't, uh, wasn't a fantastic yield, um, but the price worked out in my favor and I was very, very happy with that result. So hard to show, see here, but uh, there, there was a good catch of clover. Um, you could tell at harvest time, even when I was swathing it, um, you know, there was clover in the stand. I wasn't sure what kind of catch it was because you never know from year to year, but it looked like there was a lot of plants. Uh, we did end up baling the straw because the people that I worked with to combine it were, were very short on feed that year. So we, we did bale it up and took that residue off the field and they took it home and, and fed it to their cows. Uh, I think this this straw actually ended up being more like feed than bedding because, because of the clover that was in there. And so here's the next slide. Uh, this is what it looked like in uh, May, or sorry, I guess early June of 2022. Uh, it seemed like every clover seed that we blew on there and rolled in caught and uh, just a tremendous catch of clover. Um, <laughs> I'm not what else, sure what else to say on this particular slide other than there there were a few rock piles in the field that we had to go around so it looks like maybe the when the applicator was going by he didn't he didn't get any clover in that spot but uh but the clover stand was unreal this is a drone shot that Rob Brunel took for me I believe this would have been around June 18th so as dry as it was in 2021, the spring of 2022 in that area was extremely wet. Uh, it just rained and rained and rained and rained. This land is just east of Dauphin Lake and for whatever reason, they were just getting every single shower and rainstorm that spring. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the clover was doing very well, doing its job, uh, picking up all that moisture, uh, all the surrounding fields, as you can tell, were very, very, very wet. Uh, a lot of them did not get sown that spring. And so because I had the horseshoe in the right place, I already had my crop for 2022 in the ground and this clover was growing. Um, this- Mark, yes. uh, just going back a crop for the oats, what was your seeding rate on those oats? Uh, the seeding rate on the oats was two and a half bushels an acre. Okay. Um, that was just so, a question from the chat. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Between two and a half and three, I guess. I think uh, Rob said it was between two and a half and three. 
Uh, on the organic side of things, we usually aim for three to four bushels an acre on our seeding rate. I'm not sure what uh, other people do, but that's that's kind of our target rate. We we don't have uh, the highest technology as far as our seeding goes, so um, we that's that's kind of our our target though. Perfect. Any, okay. Any other questions in the chat to answer? That was it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the the moist conditions persisted into June, uh, through June and into early July. And so the original plan, because 2021 had been so dry and I had worked with the, the producer that combined the field, the original plan in the spring was to actually have him hay or silage the clover. Uh, but the, the land was basically too wet to even get on it. Uh, so that option at the end of June, when you'd probably be wanting to take this off as, as hay or silage early July, um, that window went by and we, we basically missed that window because it was so wet. And so uh, now what do we do, right? So we've got to that point where we've got this beautiful stand of clover uh, the option to hay it or silage it is now gone. It's the middle of July in 2022, and what do we do? And so my brother Dan said, well, we could we could roll it. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't know much about rolling clover at that point, and, uh, but I'd seen a few videos online, and it just turned out that the OPAM summer tour was at Neil Paul Guards in Saskatchewan. And he had built this ginormous roller crimper on his farm. And on July 23rd, he was going to be doing a presentation and a demonstration on rolling clover. So I don't have pictures of that particular day. Uh, I guess I do on my phone, but I didn't include it in the presentation. But uh, we went to that field day and saw what he had done. And I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Made a few phone calls and was able to locate a Mandaco or Mandaco roller crimper and was able to rent that. And so, so that was the plan. So a week later, I have a roller crimper booked and uh, just need a tractor to pull it. So I called my buddy Rob Brunel again and said, hey, Rob, I, uh, <laughs> I have this 20-foot roller crimper and I need a tractor to pull it. Ideally, something with GPS and auto steer because this is a ginormous field and um, the clover six feet tall and I won't be able to see very well. He says, well, I got a 400 horsepower quad track you can use. <laughs> so so there, there's some pictures here and uh, if we can show the video later, I'll show you uh, with this big tractor pulling a 20 foot roller, but it actually worked out great uh, for me. Uh, here's a picture of how tall the clover was. I think this might have been in the advertising that you were using, Marika. Uh, the clover was anywhere between six to seven feet tall, right across the entire field. Uh, this would have been taken, I think, early July, maybe mid-July before I'd started rolling it. And it was, it was consistent from basically one end of the field to the other. Uh, every, like I said earlier, every seed grew. And uh, I guess there'd be some carryover fertility because the oats in 2021 didn't yield very much. Um, and because of all that moisture, the clover just did unreal. It was really crazy how, how much biomass was there. So the cattle guy in me um, was cringing when I, when I got to this point in the, in the cycle because I'm like, there's got to be eight to 10 bales an acre here, or I don't know, I think 11 or 12 tons an acre of silage uh, that could be harvested and taken as feed. Um, so that part of my brain was, was melting down. But we had a bit of a plan at that point after being to Neil's place and, and seeing how what he had done with uh, rolling down clover and sowing winter wheat. So the new plan was to roll this clover and sow winter wheat. So here's a shot of me rolling the clover um, just along the field edge here. What I ended up doing was um, making six laps around the field to, to do my headland and uh, 20 feet at a time. So it took, I can't remember what the time was to, to make the lap, but it was, it was quite a while. And uh, 
I was really impressed with what uh, this little roller crimper could do because it, it seemed heavy enough, but uh, with the amount of biomass that was there, I was, I was quite concerned that we wouldn't get it, you know, rolled down or knocked down. And um, yeah, it was quite impressive what, what it was able to do. And uh, this is a picture of those outside rounds a week after it had been rolled. <clears throat> and uh, if I can show some videos later, I will. And um, basically just a, a shot of how the, the clover had been rolled down and uh, how those blades on that roller crimper, how it actually kinked the stems of the clover. And each cl clover plant seemed to have a kink every, you know, there'd be two or three kinks in the clover per stem. Every stem that I pulled up had two or three of these. And, and I was concerned, excuse me, um, <clears throat> because of the amount of biomass that was there that not every plant would get crimped. And so I pulled, I don't know how many plants, like probably 40, 50 different stems across that headland and every stem had been kinked at least two or three times. There were some, some stems that were kinked from top to bottom, but almost every one of them had two or three kinks per stem. So, so I was very, very pleased to, to see that. There's just a little close up of the, of the roller crimper and the, the notched blades that are on that crimper. Um, they're a flat blade, so to speak. And, um, and yeah, it just worked out that, uh, that the, Crimper was doing his job. Here's a picture of uh, me going more or less down the middle of the field. And uh, what I ended up doing was when I was rolling it on the advice of, of Neil, uh, he, he said that you're going to want to roll it in blocks or in strips. So what I would do is I would go six rounds at a time. And so basically it would be 120 feet rolled one way and then 120 feet rolled the other way. And that's where GPS and auto steer was the absolute cat's meow uh, for doing this so that, um, so that I wouldn't lose my spot or be wandering all over the field. And I was able to produce, you know, crimp the entire area right on top of each other, basically, right? So, so when I was coming down the, the last pass, that sixth pass, I was rolling down everything and I was basically leaving zero behind. Uh, worked out amazing. Uh, the reason for that suggestion was, is that at 120 feet, because of course I didn't have a plan on how I was gonna sew it. Uh, at 120 feet, whoever was gonna sew it for me could do it, could either have a 30 foot air seeder or a 40 foot air seeder or even a 60 foot air seeder and be able to go the same direction as the, the clover was rolled. And so that was the reason for those 120 foot widths. Thank you, Neil, for that suggestion because that was that was really, really important when it came to actually sowing the, the winter wheat a month later. Uh, this part of the field, um, I think there's, you can see there more white clover. Uh, we actually ran out of the yellow clover. So the last 30 acres uh, on the east side of the field was white clover. As far as white clover versus yellow blossom clover, I'm not sure that it mattered. I didn't see, because I had actually put up some flags, uh, I didn't see a difference um, where it transitioned from white clover to yellow clover when it came to harvest. Uh, and same with seeding, it, it, it was the same. So I don't know if there's a real difference uh, between the yellow clover or the white clover. But when you're uh, when you're in a full half section and you're rolling down the clover 20 feet at a time, and uh, Neil told me as well, I'm using his name a lot, but that's where I gained most of my knowledge, uh, that I had to go slow and to have the crimper do a good job. And so I had my my speed set at 4.2 miles per hour. And so I'm doing 4.2 miles per hour, 20 feet at a time on a 290 acre field in the middle of, uh, I guess this would have been the end of July when I was doing this. 
So I had some time on my hands. Luckily, there's a cell tower in the distance and I had good uh, cell service. So I burned through all my data on my phone doing this project. So this is what it looked like a month later. Um, incredible, really, uh, to have that amount of biomass and that amount of green growth die. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest, I was extremely skeptical when I was doing it. I, I didn't think it would be possible for that little roller crimper to kill that clover. And as you can see in the picture here, it killed it dead. Uh, this would have been taken, I think it would have been around the end of September because you can kind of see uh, some of the winter wheat already growing. And uh, yeah, I was just amazed that uh, that crimper actually killed the clover like it was supposed to do. I'll just leave that picture for a second while I have another sip of water. So, so yeah, the, the roller crimper did what it was supposed to do. The clover was absolutely dead, so we, we no-tilled uh, winter wheat into it. And I'll show some pictures after. Uh, Marika asked about uh, financial implications, and I, I didn't do a ton of homework on this, and I'm hoping in the discussion we can maybe we can talk about it a little more, but um, here are just a few of the costs. So the clover seed, I, I had at four pounds an acre at three pounds, $12 an acre for the clover seed. The application of the clover seed, I put in $8 an acre. I can't remember exactly the number, but uh, we'll use eight bucks. The roller crimper rental. I, I ended up ro renting that roller crimper through Verdant Ag, and, uh, and it was only $5 an acre. So at, at that price, I thought that was extremely reasonable. The tractor and fuel, because I'm a good buddy with uh, Rob Brunel, and, and he, um, he gave me a deal. I was basically doing 10, 10 acres an hour, uh, you know, 20 feet at a time, four, 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 four and a half miles an hour, uh, roughly 10 acres an hour. Um, the fuel, it was just sipping fuel, that big tractor. I think I was only using like three gallons or something or four gallons an hour. So, you know, roughly $20 an hour of fuel. And, and so that's what I used for a, a rough number is 10 bucks an acre. I put in here an opportunity cost of rolling instead of bailing. And uh, this is something that I'd like to discuss when we, we get into the discussion part. Um, you know, what was that opportunity cost? There was a, a mountain of feed there that I rolled down. So I'm curious, I, I, I know when I was doing the math going up and down and figuring out the price of hay and uh, what I could have used or I guess what the cost of opportunity cost of not taking it as feed would have been. That option, like I mentioned earlier, really wasn't there just because of how wet the field was. You know, that opportunity went by because of the conditions. I put rolling instead of disking three times or more. So, you know, our roller crimper rental was only five bucks. Uh, the tractor and fuel was only 10. Let's add another $5 just for easy math. So let's say it's $20 an acre. Uh, to rent a disc is $20 an acre. And um, so if you're going to disc it three or more times, you know, that's 60 to $80 an acre just for the disc rental. And then you're obviously going to have another 10 to $20 an acre of fuel costs, tractor costs, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm thinking, you know, cash costs, uh, disking it three times is probably going to be $100 an acre minimum. So, you know, I think I saved some money there. As far as other financial implications, I put nitrogen fixation and I put a hundred pounds of nitrogen here. Is that the right number? I don't know because I, I didn't do any soil testing. I, I believe 80 to hundred pounds of nitrogen is as the numbers that are floated around by, by Martin Entz and some others. I'm not sure if Martin's on the call. I can't see who the participants are, but, uh, and there might be some other people on here that, um, would know that number a little better than I do, but using roughly that number of, of 100 pounds of nitrogen. And then weed control in the following crop. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, because we didn't do any, excuse me, <clears throat> because we didn't do any disking, uh, I wasn't sure how the, the rolling of the clover would work as far as weed control, but it exceeded my expectations. That mat of clover that we zero tilled into was incredible. It, uh, it absolutely smothered any growth other than the winter wheat. And my winter wheat crop was extremely clean this past year. The big, big win in all of this so far is that I've been able to do no-till up till this point. Um, in 2021, when we sowed the oats, it was just direct seeded with an old Concord drill. We blew on the clover and rolled it. The clover was there last in 2022 and we rolled it and then we no-tilled the winter wheat. So there's there's actually hasn't been any tillage to date on this field. So when we the yeah. the caveat with that that I, I like to mention to people because I think there is no silver bullets in farming, um, is it wasn't the messiest field to begin with. And especially when it comes to Canadian thistle. I know Neil who's been really crimping, uh, has had some success with getting that that big mulch layer. But uh, when you have a well-established Canadian thistle family in your field, um, it seems to be a lot harder to get suppression from crimping. So while this one worked great, I don't want everyone to go home and think this is the silver bullet that's going to save all of the weeds and give you a no-till practice. Um, every season, every climate's different. And it sure makes me tempted to try it on mine, but I feel the need to add the like disclaimer so we don't have a lot of sad farmers when we have Canadian thistle popping through rolled clover next year. Um, if there's anyone who didn't wasn't here at the start of the call, <laughs> we'll we'll go over <laughs> the disclaimer again, Marie. Okay. <laughs> 110% correct. Yeah, we have 26 people now. So we have another, what, seven that weren't here at the beginning. Okay, so for those of you that didn't, weren't here at the start of the call, this is what I started with. It was soybeans in 2020, Roundup Ready soybeans in 2020. <clears throat> and this is how clean the field was in the spring of 2021. And I agree 110%, Marika. I had a I don't want to say unfair advantage, but there was definitely an advantage starting with an extremely clean field. Um, another question from the chat is on the soybean. What was the herbicide program, if you know? Uh, I I don't know, actually. I, I'm not sure. I, I believe it would have okay. been sprayed once in crop early on okay. as Roundup Ready soybeans. Yeah, we you know it wasn't sprayed late in the fall, just with the transition three year. Oh no, um, no, what, no, for sure yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. Um, and that's also I've heard Martin and people talk about, uh, starting off if you are transitioning acres, give yourself all of the tools you can. Um, starting off with a clean nutrient dense field is a great way, and I think seeing how well this roller crimpering worked for you is, if anything, affirmation that starting with a nice field is way easier like pain management and everything else it's easier to stay on top of our weed suppression than to win a battle that has been organic acres for 20 years at some point we kind of just live with them well and, and this is not off topic but you know when it comes to the transition of organic fields it's you're exactly right it's it's what you what are you starting with if you have been you know, slowly transitioning to organic by not spraying very much, by not using much for fertility, you know, cutting back on inputs and then transition to organic. I think that transition is going to be pretty tough because your fields are already going to be depleted in nutri nutrition and they're also possibly going to be pretty weedy as well, right? So, you know, if you've got a nice alfalfa stand that's only two or three years old and you can disc that down or plow it down or or get it established or just destroy it so that you can sow that first crop. Starting with a clean slate definitely makes a difference. And that's what I started with here for sure. Yeah. And I think there is now with regenerative agriculture and more conversations of how to incorporate these organic principles into conventional 
you can set yourself up for success to transition so well. Like there's so many resources and so many more neighbors having those conversations and intercropping and, and start off with a good fertile field before you take away all the technology. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Back to the photos. No, good disclaimer. Very, very important disclaimer. Um, yeah, so then this is the winter wheat and uh, another little tidbit on the winter wheat. So when we sold the winter wheat, uh, this would have been September 7th and 8th of 2022. It had been approximately six weeks, five to six weeks since I had rolled it because I think I was rolling it. The first roller crimping was like the end of July, then there's a rain event. So I went back on, I'm going to say the 4th, 5th, 6th of August when I finished the field. Uh, so roughly a month after it had been rolled. Um, when we were seeding it, it was again, still dry. And the challenge was we used a John Deere 1895 disc drill. And uh, the challenge when we were seeding was that we were having trouble with seed depth and seed placement. And so there was some seed that was kind of exactly where we wanted it, you know, roughly an inch and a half in the ground and some that was a little bit deeper. And then quite a bit of it was still on top of the ground because the, the discs are riding a little bit on top of this thick layer of thatch. And so I had some concerns when I left the field after it had been sown that um, we might not get much for establishment. As it turns out, the horseshoe was again in the right place. And on, I believe, September 22nd, they got uh, seven tenths of rain and pretty much every seed germinated. And so that's how we got this terrific uh, stand established. Um, the seeding rate for this was approximately two pounds an acre, or sorry, two pounds, <laughs> two bushels an acre of wildfire winter wheat. So the seeding rate was two, two bushels an acre and it was wildfire winter wheat seed. Um, again, the, the amount of material left behind from the roller crimping is evident. This would have been taken um, in, I believe, May, May 21st of this past year. So spring of 2023, uh, just a headland shot here. What I found in the spring is that the areas like the headlands um, seem to have a little bit of a jump on the rest of the field. And I believe that because the headlands would have been gone over more than once, that the clover maybe broke down a little bit more and maybe just showed up a little bit more as far as the visual side of things. When it came to harvest, um, there wasn't a noticeable difference in yield on the headlands and the, than the rest of the field. Um, there were a few spots that you think, oh, wow, this is better. But I think that was just variability in soil within the field as well. So I couldn't say that um, that I should have rolled the whole field a second time. Um, <clears throat> I maybe should have done part of it a second time, but honestly, after sitting in that tractor for four days, I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted, I wanted to get to the lake. Here's a picture from that same spot, roughly, um, of the winter wheat in July. Uh, it was looking fantastic. Uh, That's my daughter Ainsley taking a picture of me, taking a picture of her. And so um, I was very, very happy with the way things were looking. And uh, yeah, it uh, was extremely clean and uh, things were heading in the right direction. This would have been, I guess that last picture might have actually been June, but this was taken July 12th, I think it was, Marika, when we did the tour. Uh, this is a different part of the field, a little further up along the east side, just to show that it is organic. There's a few weeds that are poking through, so you can tell that it is an organic field. Uh, it was doing it, doing very well. Uh, the conditions have been good on the dry side, but um, but because it was winter wheat, it was making it through those dry conditions, and uh, you know I was encouraged by what the yield potential was. Here's a picture of uh, Marika talking to the crowd. Uh, we, we had a very, very good tour there in July. Um, 
you know, again, there's some weeds here, so you can see it's organic and the stone pile in the background. Might be a few faces and people that you recognize here. Uh, at that time, we were just discussing, you know, as far as we, we dug into the soil a little bit, um, looked at uh, some different options, some of the weed control that we had, and so on and so forth. So it was, it was good to have that tour. And then this looks like it's a picture taken off the internet, but it's uh, it's a real picture of what that winter wheat turned out to be. Um, again, I didn't have a plan for combining the winter wheat, so I had to make a few co phone calls. I have a list of about 13 guys that I had called and eventually somebody said yes. And, um, and so the winter wheat was extremely clean. It uh, yielded higher than my expectations. And um, it worked out really, really well. We had considered because again, this is a mixed farm guy that was combining for me. We talked about possibly keeping the straw to bale, um, but um, the winter wheat wasn't actually that tall. And because it's an organic field, I wanted to keep as much of the residue on the field as possible. So I, I convinced him to put the chopper on and or leave the, the chopper going. So. So the field, uh, the residue is all chopped back onto the field. And then after that, uh, we did nothing. Um, I got busy on my own farm at home into our own harvest and we just left the field as is right into fall. And uh, I didn't include the pictures of what it looked like this fall. I should have done that. Um, but basically there wasn't a whole lot of regrowth because it was a dry fall. Um, there was some winter wheat growing but uh, we actually had the combine set even though <laughs> even though it's a John Deere I don't think we threw too much over and uh, we had the combine set pretty good and um, there wasn't a lot of regrowth or, or weeds that were present at that time so so that's a really quick run through of uh, of what I did and what happened um, if I can show my screen again, I'll, I'll maybe try and grab a few videos here, Marika. Okay. And if there's any questions while I'm transitioning to that. Nothing in the chat right now. Um, one fun thing is you pull those up. So you talked about how much nitrogen you might have grown. Yes. Uh, and one of the tools we've been developing here at Manitoba Organic Alliance and with partnership on Alberta and Saskatchewan is a nutrient budget app. Um, so this is with Martin Enns and Duran Thiessen Martins. And it is basically a calculator like every input dealer has to show how much you're exporting when you have a really good yielded wheat crop. But also on the flip side, how much are you importing when you're doing things like an alfalfa cover crop um, or any legume, any nitrogen fixing? So that is using like that 100 pounds per acre of night N that you can assume, um, but getting a little bit more technical with actually what did you grow? So it's using the biomass as an estimate. And then you can either set away that biomass itself and get fully, fully testing um, to see what the nutrient profile of that plant is and put that into the calculator. Or you can use the academic value, which is where that 100 pounds of N would come from, um, and get a pretty good estimation of how much nutrition or, or fertility you're actually growing in your fields, which is really cool. Um, we are going to be doing some webinars on it further into the spring, if we can get some before seeding. If not, we'll be hitting the ground running in the fall. And it's one thing we have at our farm clubs across the province this winter has been having um, Joanne Thiessen Martins uh, come out and present on how this could work for your farm, bring some data and see. So I'll see if I can pull this up while you show these videos and see if I could do a little calculation on how much nitrogen this might have been. Sure, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, do you absolutely. have a biomass estimate? Uh, I believe that because uh, crop insurance came to, to do an estimate, I, I thought it was 11 tons an acre. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Like oh. there, there was a lot of material. Okay. And we have another question from Scott is, is, was there water in the crimper for uh, weight? No. I'm getting? no, there was not. Great question. Uh, Neil, again, Neil Paulgard, I keep mentioning his name. 
uh, he suggested that I put water in the in the roller crimper to add add extra weight. And uh, when I first started going, and I'm like looking at this, I'm thinking, gosh, I should have listened to Neil. Uh, the problem was is that I was bringing it from Verdon. I, I towed it up there with a three quarter ton truck, and uh, where the field is isn't close to a yard really. That uh, so I didn't really have access to water. That's my excuse. Um, there was a timing thing and just a matter of uh, not being able to do it. If I were to do it again, I don't believe I'd add water. Uh, the, the results I got with that machine actually were very, very good without water. I did have enough tractor to pull it if I had put water in it. So I've got, uh, I think I've got three or four videos here that I'll show of the of the crimping itself. Um, some of them are me being goofy because I was starting to lose my mind going four miles an hour, a mile up and down the field at a time. So please ignore the, the commentary or laugh if you think it's funny. Wednesday afternoon, August 3rd. I've got a little over 100 acres of clover rolled here. A little bit overkill on the tractor, but it's doing a nice job pulling that little roller. Uh, Mark, uh, I don't know if you have around. multiple monitors, but we we're still seeing the file management. Oh, okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah. You can see all the OPAM stuff that I have to do then. Yeah. <laughs> this This is better then? Perfect, yes. Okay. Wednesday afternoon, August the 3rd. I've got a little over 100 acres of clover rolled here. A little bit overkill on the tractor, but it's doing a nice job pulling that little roller. Uh, these outside rounds were done a week ago. Doesn't seem like they're quite dead yet, but they are crimped. In at least two places. So hopefully that'll be enough. Even these ones with the Flowers still on them are crimped. So maybe just needs a little more time. What uh, What is the timeline, Marika, for this webinar? We run until 10. Um, okay. But if people want to stick around for questions and conversation after, we are welcome that. Okay, well, I, I have another video or two I can show, but um, I don't have to. So if we're, we're tight for time, I can I can just keep those to myself. Uh, I, I think let's open up the floor for questions. And if sure. anyone wants to unmute and ask a question or engage in conversation, if not, we can go and do videos. Okay. Uh, David, in the chat, you said you did the same thing and saw a lot of Canadian thistle coming through. Do you want to um, talk about how that field went for you? Oh. Let me see if I can invite you to unmute. Okay, um, so I would say play another video, Mark, and you said 
11 tons? Yes. Okay. So if you want to play another video, I'll work on this calculation. Sure. This is one of the plants that was crimped last week. This is one of the plants that was crimped last week. You can see the browning slash death on one spot. Second spot. And a third spot right here. That one's toast. Recording in progress. I got, uh, <clears throat> I got one more here I'll show. I am down in the clover, looking for any sign of weeds, and I seem to have misplaced the tractor. I can hear it. I am down in the clover, looking for any sign of weeds, and I seem to have misplaced the tractor. I can hear it. Not sure exactly where it went. Well, it's pretty thick. Oh, there you are. Nice. <laughs> How many hours would you say it took to crimp that entire half section? Uh, it was uh, just right around 35 hours. Okay, so like a good farmer in our calculation of cost, time is not one of them. Nope, no, my, <laughs> my time is zero dollars per hour. Of course, we all do the same. Um. I have one in the chat. Uh, Zach, and feel free to unmute, guys, if you have a question. Um, do you have to overlap with the crimper at all? Good question. So just the way it worked out with that GPS and auto steer that I had in that particular tractor, um, the overlap was minimal, like basically six inches. And I, I was a little concerned that uh, there may be strips. Um, but uh, but actually, the way that crimper worked, it would actually almost pull it in uh, when you do the next pass. So it looked like it'd be outside, and then you'd go back, and and it got it all. So so that's how I had it set, and um, very very little overlap. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I can share my screen and show you my the calculator and see how much nitrogen that clover might have given you. So this is a tool. It's on Pivot and Grow. Um, I had to do some conversions to figure out my pounds per acre. So you can put things in. Uh, basically you can put what you have in that field. So in this case, for your clover, I would have an import of whatever your seeding rate was because seeds do have a small amount of fertility in themselves. They are adding something to the field. So we want to calculate everything we add. Um, 
in this case, I'm just looking at the biomass. It's the same whether you call it a green manure or a regrown um, hay or pasture that was not har unharvested regrowth, or if you call it forage legume, uh, green manure, um, green legume being the different. We don't distinguish between red clover or yellow clover. We're assuming they're all doing about the same, which is this academic value. If we were to actually take uh, plant nitrogen content testing, if we send it away, then we can put what that actual value is and we're going to get much more accurate results. So in this case, uh, your 11 tons translates to 22,000 pounds per acre. Uh, assuming that estimate was done on the green uh, biomass and not dry, I'm giving it a 75% moisture content for that clover, which is a little on the high end. And I'm only assuming about 98% of your field was clover. It's a very clean field. Typically, if you were polycropping or if you had a lot of weed growth, you would put what you actually expect to be. Um, and with the literature value of 2.2 for wet clover, we're still at 154 pounds per acre of N. That being said, I think that's a conservative estimate with this tool because uh, you're likely not at 75% moisture content. Um, and your nitrogen could have been a little bit higher um, given that. So if I reduce dust to sixty, we're looking at almost two hundred and fifty pounds. So it's a pretty good nitrogen fixer, especially not bailing it and exporting it. That's not just what is feeding your winter wheat crop this year, but that also is going to feed whatever you're going to do this spring. Well, that's uh, that's a perfect segue, Marika, into what should I do this spring? Um, I think there was a question in the chat about uh, did it make sense or did it work out to to have that one year off, so to speak? And so, just because of the way the markets were at the time, and because of the yield of that um, that winter wheat, it uh, it actually averaged just over forty bushels an acre. And I was able to market it at uh, $21 a bushel. So, you know, that's roughly $850 an acre. If I divide that by two, you're still over $400 an acre revenue per year. Subtract obviously all the other costs. And um, I think it still pencils out okay. What did you sell it at per bushel? Uh, $21 is what I had the contract for. Uh, that is a nice segue in the chat. Um, Ryan, two different Ryans put, I uh, the profitability of it was it worth having no cash crop for that one year? Um, which I think you've just answered. It was like that's paid. Uh, and then the next question was, does anyone know with crimping and leaving more biomass on the surface will more N, uh, volatile compared to, a uh, volatilize compared to disking and putting it into the soil. Um, so for Pengali, with just this calculator and Martin Enns and what he's doing, that's just how much um, your nitrogen fixation is and assuming what is underground through your root system. So you're using your above ground growth to estimate. Um, you're not uh, counting the nitrogen that's in that above ground growth. Um, there is some questions of like phosphorus in that biomass and would some of those nutrients be susceptible for loss since they're on top. I haven't heard many conversations about it. If anything, just affirmations of having that top biomass level um, adding to your soil carbon and if anything, trapping more things into that top soil level rather than leaving it exposed. It's making a nice mulch blanket um, to keep all of the nit nitrogen fixation that they've done underground in the ground rather than leaving it out. If we have any agronomists in this call, feel free to speak up and share. Um, okay, and then the next question, what are your plans for the field? I think Mark doesn't fully have a plan, so let's talk about it. <laughs> I, I don't. Um, so I guess it's gonna kind of be a game time decision at this point. Still have a few months before that uh, decision has to be, the final decision has to be made. Uh, it'll depend a little bit on moisture. 
the the challenge for for us is that uh, the field is remote, and I'm counting on somebody else to be able to to put something in for me. Generally, when that happens, that means you're last on the list. You know, guys are going to put in their crop first. So I'm already thinking that it's going to be something that's sown later. Uh, I'm tempted to try and do the whole thing over again. Uh, you know, grow oats and clover again. And, uh, and part of the reason for that is that the oats has all the different um, options as far as taking it as green feed or possibly harvesting it. Uh, there are a lot of cattle guys in that St. Rose area. And so, you know, I think the silage option is also an option. I, I haven't made all those calls yet, but, uh, you know, the guys that I did talk to or the people that I know up there, I think that uh, <clears throat> that would be an option and I, I definitely have buyers for it. Part of the reason for that, I think, is, is again, weed control and uh, moving forward is how am I going to, because I had this perfect storm of a beautiful, clean field to start, how am I going to manage to keep it clean? How am I going to keep the, the thistle out like uh, David, I believe it was, that mentioned? And so uh, I'll be honest, I'm not sure um, where, where to go next. I, I was talking to somebody about growing just regular spring wheat or organic spring wheat this year uh, as an option. So be, if there is all that fertility in the soil, it would sure be nice to be able to capture as much of that as possible. Yeah, and that is the conversation that we've been having on this um, nutrient budgeting app is rather than what your one year fertility is, Inorganics is looking at your five years and making sure you're averaging plus or minus five of zero on your nitrogen over a five year cycle. Because again, if we are supercharging our fertility, we're also increasing runoff and some of the negative effects that we're seeing in agriculture. We want to use up what we're growing. If we're dealing with really nutrient depleted soils, we want to add to the bank account that is there. And that's where we get soil testing and seeing what already exists before we start our practices. But we we want to use up what we grow rather than um, leaving excess that could be washed away and, and sent to other places. Spends yeah, a lot of money on it. <laughs> right, for sure. And um, and so my concern is 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 the weed pressure and, and trying to stay ahead of the weed pressure. Um, and so that's where oats may have an option, you know, if it does get weedy to be able to silage it. Wheat, if you're growing wheat, you're pretty much planning to harvest wheat. Um, you know, you don't have maybe as many options that way. Yeah, and a great comment in the chat, excess nutrients available to weeds will also lead to increased weed pressure. See, and, and uh, farming in Grand Clarier, Manitoba, we've never had that problem. <laughs> we uh, we generally don't have excess nutrients, and therefore our, our sandy fields are usually pretty clean. Yeah. No, even in our field, we have where our, our barn used to have cattle in like the 80s. Um, and the amount of pigweed that still grows out front of that barn to this day. Uh Scott asks, could you travel faster? Would adding weight increase your speed? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I do know that the speed I tra traveled worked very, very well without adding weight. Um, you know, I think talking to Neil, who's done quite a bit of it, uh, it was his suggestion that I travel that speed. I don't know if... Um, depending on the field conditions, if that would cause any sort of bounce or that you'd start missing some of it. I, I Maybe if you did add water, uh, you could go a little faster. I'm, I'm not sure. That'd be, that'd be something great for Wado to try for sure. And on that note, I know you sourced out of Arden. Um, Assiniboine West Watershed has bought a roller crimper that they own um that you can rent i believe it's per season or like a per time period rather than an acre um i'm not 100 percent certain at it. i'm pretty sure it's sitting on zach Casilni's farm right now and from what i've heard it's pretty much rented at cost for them they have bought this so that farmers can use this practice so if you live in the assiniboine west watershed uh, feel free to shoot me or the watershed an email and we can look at, at renting that one um Grant Rigby asked, is 
their problematic or good volunteer winter wheat stand? Uh, any reason to have not sown winter wheat after threshing it? Right. So um, there wasn't a whole lot of winter wheat, volunteer winter wheat, um, I'd say early in the fall because it was so dry. Uh, when I went up in mid-October, uh, there was some winter wheat growing. There was some. I wouldn't say it would be problematic. Uh, the reason for not sowing winter wheat again was um, just distance more than anything. And there was a lot going on at our own farm at the time. And so it was just a challenge to keep all the balls up in the air at the same time. So, so that would be the main reason that uh, we didn't try sowing winter wheat again. It could have been an option of just timing and uh, everything else that was going on in the world at the time. How long did it take for the mulch to break down? Yeah, so I uh, I was doing the roller crimping August, I think it said in the video there, August 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. Uh, and we sewed it on September 7th and 8th. So roughly a month uh, from it to going from six, seven feet tall, lush green to dead as a doornail, um, sewing into it. Then there was there was no clover that grew this year. So as far as the timing goes, um, if you would have been able to see in the pictures or not, like I was doing it just basically full flower um, before it had set seed. And so, you know, I was <laughs> I got lo somewhat lucky on the timing that it didn't get too wet again uh, for that field that I was able to get across the whole thing. Um, after the rain, I did have to go through or around that run. I had to cut the field up because that run was had water in it um but uh but yeah the timing was such that uh, there wasn't any any clover that grew this year okay any other questions i uh i put my cell number in the chat there if anybody has any other questions or wants a little more detail um please shoot me a text give me a call